Good morning. Very creative mornings to everyone. Creative Mornings is a monthly breakfast lecture series that typically happens all around the world. And before coronavirus, we all met, hugged, gave each other high fives, shared coffee, did a whole lot of face touching of our own face, maybe other people's faces, who knows. But this, I hope, is a, a still a place for you, a fun place for you, a safe place for you to come uh, when there's so much um, uncertainty. This month's theme is purpose, which these were chosen a year ago, but it's so relevant now in almost like a dark, twisted way. It is a really troubling time. There's a lot of pain out there right now because I know we feel, especially as creatives, that it has been hard enough to get to this point, that we had recovered from a recession, that we had played by the rules, we had, we had hustled and made our worth and found meaning despite it all. And that everything can be uh, undone overnight is, is, is really painful. And I hope uh, that we can find support uh, within each other. So I want to introduce our speaker for today. Ryan Austin Dennis, they are one of the founders of The Black Aesthetic. They are a prolific writer, inspired artist, a masterful curator. They are making it work through these times. And I'd love you all to give a warm Creative Mornings applause and welcome wherever you are to our speaker this month, Ryan Austin. So yeah, uh, I guess I'll start. I think our first slide is gonna be, where am I? Um, so what we're going to do is have like a five minute land acknowledgement breakout. And so the idea for that is we're going to break out and first we're going to talk about like, hey, what's my name? What land do I live on? My connection to the arts? Like, do you work in the arts and culture? What brings you to the talk? What do you want to bring to this moment? And the reason I want to do this is like, I've often been thinking about like, how do you kind of create solidarity within like, in terms of land, indigenous rights and access? And I've often, through a lot of my curatorial projects, been like, like kind of growing in my own acknowledgement of all of this. Is like, how do I partner with and pay and consult indigenous folks in a mode of solidarity and this way of thinking about the histories of colonialism and then how me, like me as like a black American coming here through kind of like, coming here through slavery, through other, these modes of colonial violence can build some sense of connection with these histories. Yeah, so I'm Ryan Austin Dennis. This presentation is called Artwork. What I've been thinking about recently is a lot about art institutions, how artists get paid, and what is like the future surrounding all of these things. And so I guess part of this presentation is going to be me talking about work I've previously done, um, current ideas and books that have been inspiring me, and then kind of like what's the future looking like or where, do I, where I would like to move and some bigger ideas that are surrounding it. A lot of the stuff that's been like what's given me purpose and what's driven me and driven a lot of my intention is just basically how artists get paid, how queer, like black, indigenous POC artists can build careers, have a right to live and make work. Um, and I feel like that's e even more so now that's like become such an important question in how we need to really restructure and think like about like what does it mean to do this stuff? So who am I? Recently, right now, I've been trying to think of myself as an art worker versus like sometimes maybe like a curator. Cause I feel like that word gives me a lot more room to be able to articulate more of the, the ideas that I'm thinking around and helps me connect and build solidarities with different people. I was born in Oakland and I was raised in Ohio. I went to school out there for a little bit. I studied like philosophy and entrepreneurship. I've worked in a truck lift factory and an um, insulation factory in um, Talmadge, Ohio. I moved from that job to the Bay Area and I, <laughs> my job was like an ad tech. Um, I worked for a company called Two Mogul for a little bit and I got fired because I was terrible at it. And, <laughs> so, <laughs> and during that time I was like living in um, San Francisco in the Mission. I remember paying like 4100 for like two bedroom apartment and living in the living room and it was just miserable. Um, that a whole experience and it and that was like for me it was like already kind of like showed me like the issues with gentrification displacement all this other stuff 
after like that job, I moved over to Oakland and during that transition, I kind of just pivoted directly right into like doing art basically and like curating. And so one of my first projects was um, of course, like the Black Aesthetic, which was like a film series that I did that started out at um, independent bookstore in downtown Oakland, uh, Wolfman Books. And so that was like my first step into that world. I had like a spreadsheet of 30 films of like black independent cinema, experimental work, avant-garde work. And I was just obsessed with like trying to share this work. And I worked on that project for two seasons. I edited a book. And it was also just a way for me to also find my people, basically. Um, that first initial project was like, how did I find my creative community? So it was like, how do I draw in people to, to these experiences? This is like from a talk I did. Of course, at a kind of professional level, the work that I do is kind of like this artwork, curatorial work, programming and everything else. But also like, I live in a house with like seven other people. Um, it's in like a QPOC house. My one roommate is like an independent musician and producer. Another one is like a classically trained singer um, who does work um, at Grace Cathedral. Um, another person does social work, is like a does social work at Shanti. And so a lot of like my conversations around like infrastructure building and like funding structures and like how support structures and all that stuff is like really intimately important to me. And I'm often like, and we often have like really interesting discussions around like all these different support structures and, and stuff. And like, what does it mean to make this work and do creative work um, and build lives out of it? Okay, so what have I done? What have you, <laughs> like, <laughs> I basically like sell and volunteer my administrative curatorial and producer skills to various Bay Area art spaces, galleries and museums. And I work gig to gig, like basically probably everyone else does. Um, it feels precarious and full of ambiguity and anxiety, like all the time sometimes. And I'm often like trying to piece together all these things in multiple projects simultaneously. I don't want to do that anymore. Or like, I want us to kind of think of different ways of like, how do we make our lives or whatever. But in saying that, I do want to kind of highlight some of the work that I've done recently and how, and the kind of trajectory that my work has taken me. One of my er earlier initial things I did was at the Caddist, and the Caddist is an interdisciplinary um, uh, contemporary art space as a have a private collection. They have spaces in San Francisco and in Paris. And one of my um, first shows, my first exhibition shows was called The Sable Eye. And it was an evening of like art, film and conversation um, around the proxies of blackness. And I helped facilitate it. And it was an attempt to generate a discourse that not only makes black people desirable objects of discourse, but necessitates our inclusion into the structural theoretical paradigms that we take for granted. What does it mean to like have art objects, but also like have objects that talk about blackness in subtle and not so subtle ways. So during that time, I went in their collection and I found these works of William Pope L, um, Tolian. During that, I did like a lecture in which I talk about this idea of being a black curator. And when you curate, it's often like this, this idea of like, um, what does it mean to take care of? And what are you sustaining? Or what are you kind of like uh, midwifing? What does it mean for me to be, as a black curator, to midwife the experience of black people or black artistic objects to what is most likely often like, like a white audience or a privileged audience or, you know, and so, and I was really trying to like, straddle between what does it mean between this idea of like place with what art institutions are as a, as a space and place and like who, who are the audiences I'm trying to bring in and what am I actually trying to talk about like what are the modes of access that people are trying to do that was a really big moment for me to actually really deeply question about like my execute my kind of exhibition strategy and my curatorial strategy and like what am I you know what exactly am I doing and where am I placing myself um, and becoming more aware about that another moment um, that I did was like through the McAvoy Foundation, which was much more recent. Um, it was called It's a Moment. Um, I, I co-curated this with uh, Samantha Espinoza. <laughs> it was funny. I guess Tilda Swinton had curated this show in New York through the Aperture Foundation. And the show was called Orlando, it's like based off this book and all these other topics. And, I, and so I kind of pitched them this project. And me and like Samantha had been working on it for a while. But it was funny because I was like, in the book, it talks about like, what is a society? What is social consciousness? What is social responsibility? What is human? What is the future we can envision for ourselves? You know, what is hope? And that's like kind of one of the concerns of the overall exhibition. And so I kind of like, okay, what would that look like? 
And so this public program was basically a community exchange. We came together with like the Oakland, um, Oakland uh, tech students, local Oakland um, artists, um, musicians, filmmakers. It was kind of this cultural exchange where we had people talk about their work. We also had like small vendors and the student vendors. For me, it was like a way of getting around the space and I get to highlight a, a local space, um, pro arts. And so it was like, okay, so I have like these students that are able to like get paid for their own and get to value their own work um, and speak about their work in a particular way. They also get to vend their work. And so for me, it was a moment about thinking about like showing the viability of a creative life really early on. And like, how do you create more interventions where that can happen? Um, and then also put them in conversation, put these students that are like, you know, 12, 13 year old um, young women in conversation with um, other like artists that are actually making it work. It felt like a little bit like pop-up magazine at one point, parts of it. I really enjoyed that project and it was really um, a next step in me, again, thinking about like audience engagement. What is it, what can an institution actually do? How do you like create value? What does it mean to actually make work and live and have a livelihood through artistic work and practice? My last project was with um, SF MoMA's Open Space, which is kind of like an online interdisciplinary platform. And um, it's funny, like, uh, so, and the idea was the tardigrade. Um, I was like, and the tardigrade is like this kind of real, this microscopic, really resilient animal. Um, and I became obsessed with that as a concept of thinking through um, art ecologies and the importance of them. And when we say that term, like I always hear that term in art ecosystem and ecology, it's like, what does that really mean? And we need to actually really address what that term means. It's like only the big, big monocultures get to get access to funding and capital. Like, but who supports like the small, the small collectives, the small and medium-sized art institutions? Because ecologies are actually about collaboration and exchange and about re reciprocity. So I was like trying to figure out how do I build a project where those things are actually happening. Right now, like in the background, I'm in a small press, um, the Pro Arts um, Commons Press. And so that's a print press. And I'm gonna build out these like, this whole like project structure around that within a smaller art institution with Pro Arts Commons. And then I'm gonna do a partnership with Open Space, which is also inside of like a larger artistic institution. And so, for me, it was like, to me, that's what that looks like and feels like. Um, and it didn't feel like it was a top-down response, but it felt like I was having all these different pieces that were working together. All these niches were kind of like have to play within each other. And we, and there, we, weren't, really fi we weren't fighting for resources, but we were sharing what we had. It was like a digital aspect of it and then a physical aspect. But sadly, because of you know, recent COVID um, pandemic, we, were, we had to cancel like our, our final event and we really couldn't do like the, the printing side of stuff, but it was still a way for me to kind of access and find writers, find like design with people, um, and also like give those people the, the, these kind of um, a platform basically um, to it's like talk about the things they want. And then another, it's kind of a central part of the project was I was also just trying to think through ideas of like like non-traditional forms of masculinity and which and how I pick the writers um, and like uh, there's like a link to it and so if you want to learn more about the project that's what it is so yeah so this is kind of like the the kind of work that I usually I've, I've been trying to like build in the trajectory of myself and the work that I do what are you thinking about um, and so I kind of want to kind of show some books and the important texts that have kind of like been really important to me so um one of them is actually like uh, color theory. Um, this was in this is like a Wolfman Press book, um, independent press that's like in downtown Oakland. And this book is a uh, color theory brings together fourteen women and gender non-conforming working artists of color from four generations to explore the intersections of race, ethnicity, gender, class, citizenship, and labor. And these reflection stories and remedies engage in the intergenerational dialogue on the um, ethical aesthetics and ritual landscape and systematic oppression. This is like a real touchstone for me in a lot of my thinking. Another really great book is this kind of anthology called As Radical, As Mother, As Salad, As Shelter, What Should Art Institutions Do Now? It was edited by Paper Monument. This changed everything for me. Um, I keep going back to it and it asks, really asks this question is like, why can't art institutions be, be your mother, be the place you can feed people, be shelter for people? be this like access point. 
So when we actually talk about ecology and community and, and kind of like critical work, like why can't it be those things? And I feel like our institutions need to start seeing themselves as these critical publics that necessitate like um, formations of like uh, coming together um, critically. Another one's like um, joyful militancy, building thriving resistance in toxic times. This is through AK Press. And this has been helping me think around joy and building capacity in our moments of like when, in our liberatory projects because we know it's wrong, but now we need to figure out how are we gonna to come together? How do we wanna build mutual aid structures? It's a way of like, a, I, won't, I don't wanna use the word optimistic, but it's a way of like um, sobering, like kind of coming to reality in a real way. And um, it's helped me kind of not get too depressed, basically. Um, and then um, another great book is what it means to write about art. Um, this was by the David Zorner books. This was by Jarrett Ernest. I was on a panel, an art critic panel um, with him. And this is like a massive book that has like this, all these interviews. So for like, if you're not really into like reading heavy texts, it's, this is like made me really think about like writing about art, thinking about art. This has been a central text. Another great book right now is uh, Letters to the Future, Black Women and Radical Writing, edited by Erica Hunt and Dawn uh, Lundy Martin. It knocked open my brain, like this writing, these women, amazing. This other great book is called uh, Matrix Berkeley, A Changing Exhibition of Contemporary Art. And this was done by Elizabeth Thomas with Projects Projects. I do work at BAM PFA. I do programming for the Black Life series there. And I saw this catalog and it's just this beautiful, catalog of photos, texts, and it just kind of goes over the history of this institution and the work they've done over the years. And I kind of like, I just like the scope of it. And I just like, it's a great, it's a great historical book. Um, and then this is called Parallels. Parallels was like this like um, black experimental dance moment that happened um, in dance space. And um, Ishmael Houston was like, kind of like one of the lead people in it. And it's kind of, been a way for me to kind of, again, think about like black space, um, black liberatory movement, um, and that kind of, in those futures. And it's been really kind of eye-opening. And then last but not least is um, this pamphlet on universal basic assets, <laughs> which I really love. And thinking about like, um, it's kind of like this giant manifesto for the future. It's, it's um, it thinks about things at different levels, like, um, private assets versus public accesses, assets versus open assets. Um, and so this is like the whole thing. And so it's kind of made me, again, kind of broaden my thinking around like, what are those assets that we need to respect and to find value in? Um, this was done by the Institute for the Future. Okay, so that's like all the things, <laughs> that's like a lot. <laughs> a lot of things I was... I, so those are things that have been kind of informing what I think. There's like this really cool concept that I've been really kind of diving into. This is a little bit philosophy background a little bit. It's like this term called um, parisia. Um, and it means kind of meaning literally like to speak everything um, and by extension to speak freely, to speak boldly or with boldness. The, the concept has been developed through a series of lectures by Michel Foucault. Parisia is uh, a verbal activity in which a speaker expresses his personal relationship to truth and risks his life because he recognizes truth telling as a duty to improve or to help other people as well as himself. And Paresia, the speaker uses his freedom and chooses frankness instead of persuasion, truth instead of falsehood or silence, um, the risk of death instead of life and security, criticism instead of flattery, moral duty instead of self-interest and moral apathy. I've been thinking of this concept as a way of like, how can we kind of use this, this concept as a way to organize a little bit, not really organize around, but be like really speak boldly and actually start engaging with like what the realities are um, and what the problems are. And so I kind of want to connect it to like some of these articles I've been reading in terms of like, uh, they're all so funny, they're all from Freeze for some reason. Um, but um, it's like, you can't eat prestige, what the art world can learn from organized labor like really speaking out on this stuff from basic income to four day week. How can economic ideas, new economic ideas change the art world? And then also like how a Google spreadsheet broke the art world's culture of silence. And so like, 
I feel like there, we are coming to this moment where people are really actually boldly doing and boldly saying things and having a frankness about what the issue is. One of the most important things I, I want to address is like this Google spreadsheet. It's this spreadsheet that has um, all, it's like some people were anonymous, but also people list their salaries and how long they've worked at an art space. And I would highly recommend anyone who's interested in this kind of work and financial transparency um, to kind of check it out. How do we empower art that retains ambiguity while simultaneously addressing the ethic of power? So this is like, that's the kind of continuous thing, thread line that's been happening in my brain right now. And that was from Dina Beard, um, the executive director at the lab. Through all of this, it's like, for me, I've been trying to move away from the consumer-based model of art to a public service model of art. I think a lot of the trouble now, it's like, with our institutions, it's like, oh, well, you go there in order to consume some experience versus seeing it again as a public space, a community service. And what would it, if we change that model, we would change the funding model and we would change how maybe like boards or how we come together to think about their importance. And also, this is one of my favorite quotes, is like, the art institution can help crystallize a problem on a micro scale, making it legible for a public to rally around. It does this by acting as a kind of stage for different scenarios to play out and by instigating discourse. And so these like art institutions and spaces and art like can, and galleries or whatever can actually be these modes where we can play out these really big, large ideas. Um, and have people experience the pleasure of like, of radical politics, I guess, in some ways. <laughs> like, I think, <laughs> if, if not, or like, or a real kind of change, a real change, or we can get people attuned to these, um, of new situations of, of ambiguity, um, of like something much bigger and bolder and wider. Um, and so like, I just, I really appreciate that. So I kind of come back to this as a point a kind of public point. So what's the future? How to think differently about doing good as a creative person. I, I, I'm very sure I have this, that link. Please read this. <laughs> it is so good. It was like, this was like a really good, like kind of, um, yeah, this, the creative independent, this was a really good, like article kind of workshop. It helped me again, again, if I want to do, if we want to do good work, ask yourself the question of like, am I actually doing the good work? And then also ask yourself, you don't always have to do it. Like one of the, another thing I also want to give people this space is like, this is a really good quote from it. It's like um, in it, um, she says, like, it's fine if doing good is not the, an objective of the work you do as a creative. What's more important is that you as a person are engaged and active and actively working towards a more equitable society in some form or another. There are people who cannot help but be political with their work people who make political work out of urgency and or self-preservation, but not everyone is like that. Um, your creative work can be apolitical. It's okay to work on a portfolio piece. It's okay to be expressive. It's okay to create something that encourages play, fuels escapism, or it's just for yourself. Your work doesn't have to be a solution to a problem, but consequently, you can't frame it as such if it isn't. You have to be honest about your intentions and your output especially when people's lives are involved. And so this was such a, it was just, I love how she succinctly puts this kind of together. It's like, know, know where you are, your sets of privileges, acknowledge like what you're actually trying to do with your work and move accordingly. Um, it doesn't have to be everything to everybody, but if you, and it's just like, again, just work towards that. Like you have to know yourself, listen to yourself because not every creative project needs to be a social impact project. And there's people that are already doing the work that you can either just donate to or go to the protest or do the, you know, like it doesn't have to be that, but like if you, if it really, and that's a thing that I'm often coming up against is like, okay, what, what is this actually about? And make, I'm always making sure that I align my purpose with that and my sets of principles with that all the time. And I think that's such an essential thing to kind of think through this like mobilized fest, which was like a festival that I was working on recently that was, we basically canceled. So I was working with Keith Hennessy on this. It was basically like a street art festival and, a, and like, site, like site specific performance festival that was gonna happen in Oakland and in San Francisco. 
And so we had all these artists, we had all this work. And then we were also working with um, our native advisor, Mary Jean Robertson um, on this, which was also another crucial part in this work was like, we brought her on as like, before we did anything, we were gonna be like, here's what we're doing. What do you think of this? And literally like paying her to just talk to us and tell us what she thought of these ideas and getting her sense of like land, history, um, place. And so I think this was like a way of also when I talk about like integrating, um, integrating like indigenous knowledge and an elder and like and respecting elders. And, and when we talk about this idea of like doing good work, like that's like part of the process, like consulting with people that actually live in the space and actually have real ties to the space. And I would also use this to address like in terms of like black displacement um, and houselessness and like unsheltered folks. Like if you're doing, gonna do that work, like pay the people that actually know the space um, that have lived there um, and actually have a real discursive knowledge um, and embodied knowledge around that stuff. But, um, but yeah, so like this festival was a, a lot about like thinking a bit about what public art can do. Um, and it was funny, like uh, I have this quote where I was thinking about like, you know, I think it presupposes, when we ask this question of like, what can public art do? I think it presupposes a certain form of like civic functionality. And it seems to me that artists are being demanded to essentially, essentially provide social services, but that's not our role. And I think sometimes I feel like that's my kind of tension point sometimes with social practice work. But sometimes I would always want to ask like a politician or a councilman person or whatever. It's like, what, do, what actually does, what can public art do? Like, what is your vision around it? Because I think they have, they don't have the imagination and scope to actually really think about these things. Um, and I think we can actually demand and reassert different things about um, our cultural imagination and what the possibilities are. Um, but in saying all of that, like, so we had this, this festival and what we ended up doing was like, we just pay people. We canceled the whole thing. We first gave them a payout because right, that was around March. So the, when, um, when the stay, stay in place actions are happening, we were just like, you know what? Um, we talked about it, it was like, okay, let's just pay them to, to do the work. Again, thinking in a public service model, thinking um, in a, an artist has a right to live and they don't always have to produce something um, and that, they're, that they are important regardless of um, their output. Um, because their thinking and their ideas and how they engage with the world is important. So we had like, I think it was like around 1500 for each artist. And so we did our second payout, like I think this week or so. And so in that, in that moment, it, it, that was like a big shift for me because I was like not even concerned about whether the event was going to happen. I was concerned about like, they, they were, artistic process happens through thinking and doing and practicing and not just the end product and the end goal. Some initial ideas, artist UBI, artist worker bailout. We need an artist worker bailout and financial tra transparency. That's the future for me. Canada did this really cool thing. So Canada had this art, art award and they divided the grand prize am among the um, long listed artists. And so what they did, the director, Sasha, um, restructured the whole grant. And so, I mean, the, the prize, and they administered $25,000 um, to like 25 of the long listed artists, which I think is brilliant because that's what we need to do. This was an interesting idea. They proposed $20,000 in the pocket of every working visual artist in the US. And they estimated a total of like 247,000 fine artists in, American, in the American labor force. There's more, but I just like this like idea. And that sum comes to like $4.9 billion. And that's like, that's actually nothing compared to, um, to like the whole bailout structure because the, um, the Alliance for American Museums, they asked for $4 billion for like, at one point, they did a letter to Congress for that. And they didn't get nearly as much as they needed. And then the financial transparency number is like, I have a, I have a link to the arts and all museum salary transparency um, document. Look at that, it is an essential thing. Let's just do a quick thank you. Thank <laughs> you.